Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, good evening, everyone, or indeed good morning for Dylan and anyone else who's coming from his side of the world. And welcome on behalf of uh, uh, my co-organizers of the webinar, Steve Cushion and uh, Kate Quinn. It's actually, uh, of course, a great personal pleasure to welcome uh, Dylan Vernon. He's a former ambassador uh, of Belize to the EU. He's a former chair of the Political Reform Commission of Belize. And we're delighted to celebrate the publication of his book this evening, Political Clientelism and Democracy in Belize, From My Hand to Yours. The book was published earlier this, this year by the University of the West Indies Press. And Dylan is currently director of DGov Consulting Limited in Belize. So we will follow the usual pattern. Uh, Dylan will speak for around 30 minutes or so. There'll be a Q&A, so I hope you will uh, keep your questions or have questions in mind. And of course, you can ask them in the chat or you can raise your hand uh, using the button at the bottom of your screen. And Dylan's presentation this evening is entitled Buying Votes and Political Influence in the Caribbean, Lessons for Democracy from Belize. Dylan? Yes, good morning. Um, thanks. You can hear me okay? Yes. Good, good, good. Thanks, Gad. And um, greetings to all from Belize, where um, indeed it is morning still. And uh, by my calculations, um, 28 degrees warmer than London, where you are. Um, well, thanks for this, this kind of invitation to return to my alma mater, even if it's virtually. Um, in a sense, this, this Caribbean seminar, and I've participated in quite a few, um, this one represents the UK introduction, um, if not the launch of my recent book, um, uh, as uh, Gad was saying, published by UE Press in April of this year. Um, after several book, well, two book launches, one in Belize and, and, and one virtually for the Caribbean. Um, uh, thanks for allowing me the space to introduce the book here. Um, but before I, I go into that, let me um, extend my condolences to the UCL family and also the family of Professor Kevin uh, Middlebrook on his passing. Um, he was my excellent and rigorous thesis supervisor. Um, and Kevin not only had a great impact on, on the thesis that birthed this book, but also um, became a colleague. Um, in, in my book, I, I use Belize, and um, I'll, I'll be sharing more on this book later. I, I use Belize as a case study to trace the pre-independence origins of political clientelism in Belize, uh, to map its post-independence expansion, to discuss uh, why it expanded, and also, most importantly, um, to analyze and examine its uh, implications for um, the quality of democracy and development uh, in Belize. Uh, I also include in there a chapter, a comparative chapter on the Caribbean. Um, today, I, I, I don't want to speak so much to the book in terms of all that's what's in it, but try to think about the book more in Caribbean perspective. And let me introduce my topic today, um, the, the buying votes and influence, political influence, uh, and lessons for the Caribbean from Belize. Um, let me introduce my topic today by referencing a, a recent political scandal in Belize, a kind of cautionary tale. Um, on the 15th of November this year, just last month, um, John Saldiva, a former senior minister in the previous government of Belize, was publicly designated as a person involved in, quote, uh, significant corruption, unquote by the US State Department. The State Department alleged that, quote, Saldiva accepted bribes for the improper acquisition of Belizean immigration documents and interfered in public processes for his personal benefit during his tenure as a government official, unquote. Saldiva's US visa and those of his immediate family were revoked. While we may justifiably, in fact, I, I, I'm sure you 
some of you in the audience might join me in objecting to the US making such unilateral you know, designations. Uh, but it was not the first of such allegation for Saldiva. Most significantly in February of 2020, John Saldiva's long sought victory to become party leader of one of Belize's two major political parties lasted only 72 hours. In just those few hours, evidence was obtained that confirmed rumors that Saldiva, this was in 2014, had received large sums of money in several tranches from a US businessman who was in trouble with the law in the US. Saldiva was fired from cabinet, um, not for any proof of bribery, but for lying to cabinet that he had received fund funds from this businessman. Saldiva then narrowly lost his bid to regain the port leadership, which he had been forced to uh, relinquish. In subsequent statements, Saldiva, who continues to deny all allegations of quid pro quo, that has to be said, continued or uh, contended that the funds were just campaign contributions to assist his constituents, to assist his constituents. I will come back to this Saldiva episode later, but those last four words to assist his constituents are directly linked to the central argument I will make to you today. The capitalism. That argument, that message is that political clientelism and especially <laughs> The buying, I think someone has their, uh, their mic on. Yes. That argument and that message um, is that political clientelism, and especially for today, the buying of votes and of political influence has gone too far and has reached a critical saturation point of normalcy with damaging consequences for social democracy. As such, it is one of the more persistent blights on the traditionally positive narrative on democracy in the region. While the focus of my book is on the case of Belize, I will seek, as I said today, to put the problem of political clientelism in a, in a wider Caribbean perspective. Before turning to the discussion on the causes and the implications of the problem, let me start with a couple of basic definitions and share a few examples to illustrate its, its re regional uh, prevalence. And uh, for this, I, I will share um, a screen here. Um, <laughs> this, this photograph that starts my, uh, my slide presentation, just a couple of slides actually, it's not John Saldiva, by the way, it's another um, politician um, from Belize who was caught in a scandal too and, and also had to leave cabinet um, related to a similar set of events. But, uh, that is for another time. But in terms of the, the definition, um, political clientelism, this is a central concept that underpins my work, is that formal political transaction where politicians who we can call patrons hand out or promise resources and services to people, we can call clients, in return for political support or for the promise of political support. More commonly in the region, it goes by the name of patronage politics, benefits politics, or handout politics. But I use the term political clientelism because it captures more broadly the full range of transactions in the exchange of resources and favors for political support. Vote buying and, by extension, vote selling are generally the most tangible and visible manifestations of political clientelism. In essence, however, there are but subcategories. Um, as we shall see, political support can come in ways other than votes at election time. So clearly, um, by this definition, political clientelism is a universal phenomenon that all countries experience in some form and to some extent. It is in no way unique to Belize or the Caribbean. However, what stands out in the Commonwealth Caribbean for countries like Belize is the extent of its deep entrenchment, how it manifests itself and the damaging repercussions it has for small developing states, such as those like Belize. 
Indeed, the post-independence expansion of political clientelism in the region is relatively easy to establish. Regarding allegations in particular of voter bribery and buying elections alone, a scan of regional news articles just over the past 15 years would reveal hundreds of related stories. Just in Belize alone, I identified over 50 such stories between 2005 and 2015. And just a handful of examples, I think uh, it, it's worthwhile to share from across the region um, to make uh, the point. And, and again, I, I will uh, uh, share screen here to uh, put up some examples. Um, I will not go through these all in detail, but um, it just gives you a flavor of some of the, the sort of uh, headlines you find just by a little looking um, with, with some keywords. Um, the first one, Bahamas PM races for buying concerns. That was um, 2012 from the Caribbean News Now. And, and in that article, uh, both the opposition, both the government and the opposition accused each other of uh, vote buying before an election. The second one, Barbados bans camera phones and, uh, and cameras from voting locations to prevent fraud. This one is a common one that you see over the Caribbean. And, and the, the key thing behind this is that politicians uh, have been trying to find ways to get proof that the people they have given some money or resource still vote the way they, they, they want. So you, you take back the photograph of the, um, of the ballot to the politician, then you get the, your money or the other part of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there have been moves to, to ban this practice um, in, in parts of the region. A Belize example, uh, political Christmas assistance program is vote buying, says PUP. And here, this is an example that occurs across the region again, um, around Christmas time, Easter time, uh, when school reopens, political clientelism spikes and both sides accuse each other of uh, engaging in, in, in this sort of practice. Um, uh, an example from Jamaica, votes for sale, St. Thomas Youth, same money, up front or no X. And, and this was accompanied by a, by a photograph of uh, youth um, basically in, in t-shirts saying um, uh, they wanted uh, resources, money for, for their vote. Um, very open and blatantly done. Uh, the other one, St. Vincent ruling party denies vote buying. Um, again, this was uh, one of those examples where both the ruling government and the opposition accused each other of the same thing. Um, this final one uh, is more recent. Um, it actually should be uh, 2022, not 2002. Uh, Prime Minister filling, filling, handing out cash to constituents as elections loom. This was from the Antigua Observer um, of just the 17th October, 2022. And in relation to this uh, particular one, um, you might know that elections are, are, are due soon in uh, Antigua and Barbuda, and a video was circulating on social media, um, allegedly showing the prime minister handing out money to people. Um, while the prime minister denied the comment or to comment, the chairman of his party is quoted in the Antigua Observer, um, that same one, as saying, quote, this is not vote buying. You can clearly see that money is requested from the prime minister and he merely obliges as those of means we are expected to give to those who do not have, unquote. This justification or this excuse uh, of just helping the people is widespread and, and, and common across the region. Let me uh, just pause here to, to make a, a quick observation. Um, while, while there are certainly stories of big money buying uh, influence in the UK, in UK elections, I, I doubt that you would find examples these days of such uh, direct vote buying allegations in the UK press. And, I doubt, Gads, that uh, you would go to your MP 
one day to 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 get some some uh, some cash or some resources to assist with your heating bill for example um so it it manifests itself in in different ways it's not to say that um there there is no uh buying of political influence and an attempt to to do um general sort of bribery of what is elsewhere but the point here is that in the small states across the caribbean like belize political clientelism has become a pervasive and, and, and more and more normal and more and more open phenomenon. And it is not at all restricted to election campaigns. In Belize, almost every politician and at least 20 to 25% of the electorate play this clientelist game, this handout game as we might call it all year round. This activity spikes, as I said, at times like Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter's, school reopenings, but it's always there. Every week in Belize, poorer Belizeans line up at political clinics of representatives or candidates like John Saldiva of both major, major political parties for handouts to pay the water bill, take a bus, buy food, pay medicines, uh, pay a school fee et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Medications um, is, is, a, is a big one. Or it may be that they want to get on a list to get a better uh, chance to get a piece of land or housing supplies or to get a recommendation letter to speed up some service or to get a job in the public service. Uh, but some middle class, some middle income citizens line up too, but they tend to use other means of making their requests known by letters, phone calls, direct visits, and their requests are for bigger, more expensive things. Importing a car duty-free, a second piece of land, um, jobs for relatives, a university scholarship, and things like that. This may all sound familiar to those of you um, who have some uh, sort of connection to the Caribbean, um, but there, there are many other examples of, of this kind of thing. While there are some nuances, the clients in Belize come from all age ranges, from all ethnic groups, sectors, geographical areas. However, as the number of middle class uh, clients um, has also been increasing, poorer Belizeans do make up the majority and women tend to outnumber men, uh, in, at least in the case of Belize. In short, Apart from money, almost every resource and service can be bartered in exchange for the promise of political support. For the Belize case and for my own book, um, I compiled a, a list of uh, 20 categories of what can be provided, each having several specific um, resource and, and, and services as subcategories. I also compiled a list in the book of the key types of political support that are given or promised by citizens in addition to the vote. Uh, these are, are too numerous to, to mention now in, in terms of the time that we have, but I, I will only put up uh, a slide to, to give you an example of uh, what, what can come from politicians in addition to money. Um, I, I mentioned some of these already. But more importantly, on the on the left, on the right hand side, uh, what what comes from clients in addition to votes, they can be the promise of votes, attending party events, um, uh, making up numbers at protests, wearing party colors, calling talk shows to support your candidate, campaigning, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, and things like this. So um, that's just a, a, a snapshot. In in the book, I use. Uh, mostly newspaper articles, reports of commissions of inquiry, but especially numerous interviews of politicians and voters uh, to document the expansion of, of these political transactions in the post-independence period in Belize. I argue that what transpires in Belize um, repeats itself across the region, even with different textures and to different extents. Yet, I think that um, we find it still, and I found this both in my uh, work in Belize and in my discussions in the region, that 
we find it uncomfortable to talk about these the, the, this, these transactions and, and this phenomenon in our small Caribbean states. It's unspoken, it's not out in the open. This is in no small uh, part, of course, because some of the manifestations of political clientelism are quite distasteful. And because much of it is illegal for both politicians and voters. Um, representative uh, or electoral laws across the region um, prohibit voter bribery and, and uh, make it illegal and their fines uh, and terms of imprisonment and being barred from elections for violations. But as in the case of Belize, as I will say, um, there has been no conviction, prosecution of voter bribery, um, in, especially in this case, in the case of Belize since, well, before and after independence. And we can discuss perhaps why in, in, the, in the question and answer. Let me turn to what um, I, I, I found uh, to be the key drivers of this expansion of political clientelism um, in my book. And, and I build my arguments around uh, three broad and overlapping causes, drivers, if you may. And, and, and we may say these are all layered on top of uh, the age-old motivations of greed and, and self-motivation or self-enrichment. The first driver is, a, is, is the sort of societal context of worsening poverty and inequality and the inadequate social and economic response to mitigate these. In the book, I show in the case of Belize how poverty and inequality that was birthed in, in the colonial period and made worse by neoliber neoliberalism uh, in the post-independence period um, has provided fertile ground for clientelism to take root and to expand after independence in 1981 in the case of Belize. And in the case of Belize, uh, poverty rates have increased from 33% in, in 1995 to near 50% today. Inqu and income inequality has expanded. For the most part, the state's institutions, and especially those related to providing formal social welfare, have been inadequate in meeting social needs. And so providing a vacuum for politicians, among others, to fill using informal means, such as clientelism, the, the key, uh, the second key factor is related to how the Westminster parliamentary system actually works in Belize and in, in most of the small states in the region. In short, as you know, we have a winner takes all system in which opposition and alternative voices are locked out and in which oversight mechanisms are mostly toothless. It is not unrelated to the fact that small numbers of MPs the small numbers of MPs in our parliaments facilitates a situation in which more than half of the MPs usually end up in cabinet. The result is that politicians end up with uh, highly centralized power, discretionary power, uh, power that is, and control over resource allocation that facilitate the use and abuse of official offices for clientless transactions. The, the third driver is quite straightforward. Um, that is the intense electoral competition to gain control of these vast powers of state. Um, and, and this has created conditions that are very conducive for political clientelism to thrive. In, in small constituencies, and in, in, in Belize, uh, the constituencies average about 5,300 uh, uh, per constituent. There are 31 constituencies in Belize. This can be won by mere hundreds, uh, sometimes uh, dozens of votes. Uh, so it, it becomes, that is, political clientelism becomes a very attractive and also affordable electoral strategy when winning a shot at controlling this vast power of state is, is, is the big prize. Across the Caribbean, then, the general post-independent narrative is one of political parties competing and are bidding each other on which can have the best clientelist machine to dispel patronage. And so this uh, rises uh, the, the stakes in every election. Um, one one uh, uh, broker had given me the example um, of this in that when one party is, is uh, giving out uh, chicken and the other party begins to give out shrimp, 
everyone begins to give out shrimp. And so it, it goes on and on and on, and it gets bigger and bigger. So generally speaking here, the, 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 the rise of political parties as clientelist machines across the region, uh, and I, I, I make this point in the book, is inversely related to the dwindling ideological narratives, uh, uh, distinctions, I should say, dwindling ideological and programmatic distinctions between the parties. This is certainly the case in Belize, where substantive policy differences between the two major parties are almost now non-existent, and the competition is more and more than who has the best clientless machines. And, and a final point on, on, on this third driver is that in, in Belize and some states in the region, the, the actual legal electoral apparatus has become both politicized, sorry about that, uh, politicized and, and weakened over time, and too often results in impunity for those engaged in, in voter bribery. In the case of Belize, no allegation, as I said, of voter bribery has ever been successfully prosecuted, pros, uh, prosecuted before or after independence. The, the, the final um, section then in my presentation will be looking at what I spend most ink on in the book, um, that is, the, what are the consequences and, and the damaging consequences of the extent of the spread and the degree of entrenched political clientelism. Um, and in the book, I pinpoint some 15 aspects of this damage, which, which I can't go all into. So, um, let me categorize them here just uh, perhaps on the three broad problem areas. Uh, problems for electoral democracy, problems for transparency and accountability, and problems for social democracy. In terms of electoral democracy, um, I think it's most obvious here. If only a fraction of the numerous allegations of voter bribery and buying elections across the region are true, it still means that elections at every level, at the constituency level, uh, at the uh, national level, uh, can and do turn on who is most successful at buying votes. And, and what does this mean for the region votes of standing out for its record of free and fair elections? Uh, what does it mean for ballot secrecy when politicians seek proof from voters as to whether they keep their side of the bargain? What does it mean for individual political freedom? And if political support is bothered, um, does it not lead politicians to treat citizens primarily as clients and not as participants? And lead citizens, on the other hand, to view politicians more as, as patrons and less as representatives? In Belize, um, it has become the norm for one political party to encourage um, voters to take bribes from the other party and, 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 and to not vote for them. And I know I've shared this, uh, this, this particular slide a few times, and, and uh, those of you who have seen me present might uh, be sick and tired of seeing it, but uh, we, we, we have um, situations where, as I said, uh, a, a particular party, in, in this case the opposition, uh, urge voters to take the money, take the ham, take the passport, and they'll take the land from the governing party, but still vote for the PUP. So it, it's encouraging the, the very uh, uh, political transaction that um, they, they themselves are participating in and encouraging people to, in a sense, uh, break the law. It's, it's illegal to, to accept bribes uh, in, in, in the context of the Belize also. For sure, um, one other collateral damage or one key collateral damage um, of the, this deep entrenchment of political clientelism in the region is the locking out of alternative voices and underrepresented uh, groups who either frowned on handout politics or, or cannot afford it and, and not being able to afford it is one of the reasons that many people don't uh, enter and the politics. And, and in, in terms of then uh, the second area, the problems for transparency and accountability, um, it, it goes without saying perhaps that political clientelism and political corruption are, are very close first cousins. 
uh, the overlaps between them are simultaneously straightforward and murky. It has to do with where the money, com money comes from, of course, and, and the resources and the services that politicians bought for political support. And it's a very extremely expensive game. Broadly speaking, there are two interrelated sources. Um, one is that incumbent politicians find creative ways to tap into public resources and services for the use in clientelist transactions, uh, passing some of these onto their constituents, keeping some for self-enrichment and for their inner circles, but also trading some for private money or some other kind of gain. The, the other key source is when private donations are sought and used for clientless inducements. And there are inevitably here opportunities for private gains, not only for the politician, but especially for the donors who get returns on their investments through such means as favorable legislation, tax write-offs, fee waivers, bloated contracts, passports, plush appointments, and so on and so on and so on. I think uh, you all know the game very well. In short, to service the ever-growing demands from constituents uh, and to compete with the opposing politician, there's a constant drive to maximize access to state and private resources and to seek new opportunities. We only tend to get a, a glimpse into this murky and this secretive game when a political corruption scandal breaks, like the one with, with John Saldiva in Belize. The, the Saldiva episode, more than most political scandals that have broken, and there have been several in Belize and across the region, uh, the Saldiva episode provides a glimpse into the paper trail of how politicians at great reputational risk target wealthy and sometimes shady private donors and illustrates also how one of the motivations for this, and it's one of the motivations for the key one, for this is to meet the continuous demands of clientelist operations, that is to assist, help your constituents with the understanding that uh, it is going to be from my hand to yours and something's expected in return. So accountability and transparency challenges are clearly endemic to clientelist relationship because politicians and donors and those constituents who benefit are all incentivized to keep the transaction secret, to avoid paper trails, and to ensure that the pipelines remain open. Where some accountability systems and procedures do exist, and, and, and they do exist this across uh, exist across the regions, um, their voter bribery laws, as I said, audit requirements, their integrity commissions, um, these are often either weak or not effectively applied. Um, and, and the politicians in power um, tend to uh, have a disincentive to, to make these things work, of course. So accountability systems can also be um, totally absent. And uh, one very good example in Belize and several Caribbean states, I think most Caribbean states, um, is that there are absolutely no laws to regulate campaign financing. Absolutely none. In short, um, in the process of maintaining and growing clientless operations, I show in detail in the book with many examples how state resources are abused and wasted, how needed pol uh, public revenues are lost, how governance reform to arrest the abuse um, are usually stifled, uh, how unaccountable big donors uh, who provide the big money tend to call more of the shots and, and get huge returns on their investment. And on, on this particular one, I, I give many examples in the book, um, and I, I reference in particular um, the example of uh, Lord, Mike, Lord Michael Ashcroft, um, who, who you might know from his involvement in your own politics, but uh, he has been one of the biggest donors to both political parties and believes over time. And it is clear that some of his money have ended, has ended up in uh, these political clinics and for these clientless operations. But time prevents me from delving into these examples right now. Um, 
And before concluding, let me turn to uh, this third uh, problem area, problems for social democracy, perhaps the most important to me. We have seen uh, on the part of the politician, the ultimate motivation for playing this handout game is, of course, to win the next election, self-enrichment being a part of that. On the part of the citizens, the ultimate motivation is to get a needed or desired benefit with the knowledge that politicians want their political support. Um, and as, as a segue, I, I, I remember the number of citizens I spoke to who use the excuse, um, well, I, I, I'm, I need uh, something uh, in my life. Uh, sometimes it is a basic need or the playing field is not level. But they, they would say, uh, if I don't do this and the other person is doing it, then, then I'm a fool because I, I need to also get what I need. And one of the last things they would say is that, and the politicians are teething anyway. So um, what they're giving us is what they're teething. But that, of course, is uh, something that we can get into a bit more later. Um, as I argue in the book, however, um, poor people do benefit in a context of great social need. There, 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 there's no argument here. Um, in, when people are poor um, and you go to a politician and you get something, it, it does still satisfy a basic, uh, urgent and short-term need. Um, however, I also show that most of the benefits are so immediate and short-term that they do not, of course, address the root causes and the longer term solutions in terms of uh, the problems related to inequality and inadequate social welfare. And the distributive benefits for individuals overall then are heavily outweighed by the overall damaging effects. Importantly, um, entrenched political clientelism distorts social welfare provision. I think most Belizean and Caribbean politicians, especially those of the ruling party, have evolved into air-rung informal welfare agents and gift givers, bartering almost every needed or wanted resource for political gain. This has become so normalized, so much a part of the political culture, that it is little questioned. And when politicians are questioned and challenged, they defend, as I said before, the practice with the simple retort of helping the people. A recent case in point uh, came up just after Hurricane Lisa hit Belize only last month, when the government announced that public funds for immediate relief to help the people will not be distributed through the emergency organization or through government departments or even through NGOs, but rather these public funds would go through members of parliament and also candidates of the uh, opposition. The government sought to assure that records would be kept, yet it is an open secret once politicians call the shots and who gets what, it is near impossible to mitigate partisan motivations and clientless motivations. And when more public funds and services do go through politicians, the public institutions that exist for these purposes and that have built-in accountability procedures and merit-based approaches, these are sidetracked and also for the weekend. And even more, social welfare becomes politicized. So in, in conclusion here, um, let me say that in the book, I, I coined the term mutual clientless dependency mutual clientless dependency to describe that critical pivot point in the trajectory of clientelism when the collective weight of the demands of citizens uh, begin to drive the clientless relationship from the bottom up as much as the dangling of material uh, inducements from above. It's, it's, it's this point where politicians and a significant portion of voters become dependent on the clientless game to meet their uh, differing interests. I think reaching this point is a red flag, an alarm bell, that political clientelism has reached um, dangerous levels of entrenchment and with overall negative impact. I argue that 
Belize is now at that point, and I speculate that so are most Commonwealth Caribbean states. There is no doubt that mutual client list dependencies system is uh, systemic and will be extremely difficult to break out of and to mitigate. The short-term prospects are not good. Not only is there what is akin to a client list cold war between the major political parties in, it, in which neither side will unilaterally disarm its client list machinery first. And not only does the prevailing neoliberal policy framework place limitations on addressing the higher rates of poverty and inequality, but there's also that critical basic question that was asked by Broca in my interviews with him. He asked, uh, quote, what will replace it? What will replace this entrenched informal welfare uh, system? It's a very important question. But addressing the, the poverty and the inequality that helps fuel political clientelism, especially, as I said, in this neoliberal world, will be clearly long term. And as we do but that better, we simultaneously need to explore what legislative, regulatory, and also constitutional reform measures we need to take to mitigate widespread and systemic political clientelism. I have some ideas. Uh, on this and we can discuss perhaps in the question and answer. But let me end by saying, uh, as with most problems in the, in the world, um, in our political systems, um, our societies, the first step is to acknowledge that we have a problem. And I hope that my book uh, helps in this regard. Um, Gad, I will leave it there for now. Thank you. Great, great. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting and lots of uh, provocative things and things to think about. I, I will uh, uh, respond to your uh, personal uh, <laughs> statement about uh, 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 RMP and about the chances of our making any impact financially. It may interest you and other, other participants to know that our local MP is none other than one Keir Starmer. <laughs> so, so the chances of this happening are, shall we say, uh, remote, even though he has actually appeared at our door uh, <laughs> on a campaign trip uh, some years ago. So that's quite interesting. But uh, I, I, I will, uh, there, there's already, I think, a, a raised hand, but I would like to uh, usurp my position to ask you uh, a question while people are thinking, um, and there are many actually, but one of the questions I had if I heard you correctly, had to do with clients and what I think you call them clients. And uh, particularly, I think there was a gendered element to your discussion of clients. And of course, poor people, I understand, but women in particular. And so I, I did wonder about that element. Why uh, women in particular, if I may ask that? Yes, yes, good. Um, yes, it, it, it the Belize case did show that um, in, in responses from especially politicians that about 55 to 60 percent of the, the uh, people who came to them for, for some requests uh, uh, were women. Um, and um, th this, this is, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, uh, on the surface, um, could be quite strange because there are fewer women in elective politics generally in, in, in Belize and across the region. Um, but, uh, and, and also almost all the brokers, these intermediaries that all politicians use, almost all of them were men. I think there were, there was only uh, two women I found in the entire, in the entire process. But I, I think it has to do, of course, with the fact that um, uh, poverty rates in Belize show that um, more women are poor. Um, it has to do with the fact that uh, women have higher rates of unemployment and that many, uh, especially, um, well, both, both, of course, uh, single-headed uh, households that are headed by women and even households that, uh, or, or families, that, that women tend to be the managers of basic, uh, meeting the basic needs of the family. Um, and, and so... Uh, Politicians shared some of, of, of these, these, these um, with me too. But one, one, two other interesting things about uh, the, the gender issue is that politicians related that 
women tend to um, request uh, uh, less money or resources of less value than men. Men would, uh, they, would they, they would ask for basic needs and, and men would be more alone for a car or, or that kind of thing. Uh, it was more directed at meeting basic needs. And finally, um, politicians did relate that um, they found that dealing with women clients, um, they were less confrontational than men. <laughs> um, uh, one said that they were easier to satisfy with less, if, if I can recall the, 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 the comment. And, um, and politicians also related that they preferred to deal with women because they felt more certain that the resources shared would be put to better use. And, and so those were some, some of the <laughs> general findings coming from the my own case study, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So Victor, if you uh, unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Uh, Dylan, really fascinating talk, as indeed uh, is the book. <laughs> But um, I do have a question for you. But first, can I just say, I share with you the concern at the fact that John Saldivar seems to have been um, blocked in his uh, practices by the US State Department rather than by any uh, legislative or other process in Belize. That is deeply disturbing. And of course, we have to remember that he was picked up by the US de State Department because of what John Saldivar was doing with um, facilitating immigration into the US. If he had not done that, presumably the US would have been perfectly happy to leave him alone. So there's lots of things about the Saldivar story that are deeply worrying. However, what I wanted to ask you about is you are describing something that's almost like a perfect crime. And yet, it actually has flaws, if you think of it, not in moral terms, but just as a, as a system. And the flaws are this, you actually said, almost all politicians partake, partake in political clientelism. Well, that means that there must be a few who don't. Not all businessmen, businesswomen, take part in um, uh, donations to political parties expecting favors in return. So some of them, uh, uh, are not part of this uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, process. But the most intriguing one for me is the 75%, this is using your own figures, who don't benefit from political clientelism, who don't actually receive handouts, who don't uh, get any particular benefit in return for voting <laughs> one way or the other. So could you tell us a little bit about these three actors who uh, somehow, <clears throat> don't fit into the perfect crime story, the handful of politicians who don't do it, the business people who don't participate, and the 75% of voters who don't take part? Good, good question, very good question, um, Victor. And um, it reminds me of discussions we've, we've had on, on this issue. Um, and, and, and that's, what you've said uh, perhaps is where um, the the hope lies to to help to arrest this problem. Why? What are the non clientist clientless voter motivations um, that uh, that we can tap into? When it comes to the the politicians themselves, um, it is I I think that while some politicians um, in Belize, and talking about Belize here, have used uh, this much less than others. Um, I would be hard pressed to identify one in recent times that that has not used it or have people around them doing it on their behalf with their knowledge. Um, and and so, no politician I think has won an election in Belize. I would say in, in, in the past 20 years or so, without using uh, political clientelism. And if they are not involved themselves directly, they have a network of people who are doing it on their behalf. But when it comes to the voters, my estimate of 20 to 25% of the electorate playing 
the handout game in some way does mean that the majority of voters are not playing the game. And in, in the book, I, um, I, I, I looked at um, some of the, the, the limited polling done to show that um, a, a, a good proportion of voters, um, I, I forget the figures right off, do vote um, or do want to vote based upon issues more and, and, and uh, the personality and the character of the candidates more than they do uh, by, by some inducement. Um, these voters, and I did speak to some of them, uh, would be those who would find the entire game of uh, political clientelism very distasteful and uh, who in a small society would not want to be seen in, in one of those lines uh, by the rest of the society. And, and so uh, that is uh, certainly part of the response, um, Victor, to, uh, Victor, to, your, um, to your question. Um, the, the nature of clientelism itself is, is one that would discourage people from uh, from participating in it, but but I think that to to end having more or increasing that seven to five percent to 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 a higher level uh, is something that uh, we need to explore in in the context of beliefs, but also with the understanding that that twenty to twenty five percent who are involved in a regular way. The, the impact of that on, on the broader and, and the rest of the 75% uh, in, in huge ways outweigh the good that that 75% is doing because of the overall damaging effect it has on the electoral process and, in, 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 and especially um, transparency and accountability and, and social democracy. Okay, great. Steve? Yes, uh, thank you, Dylan. Uh, and when you speak of social democracy, it <coughs> made me wonder what uh, do the trade unions play a role in this in any way? Uh, because there does seem to be a lack of class politics, if you will, in uh, uh, in Belize. I uh, 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 and. I just sort of wonder, you know, is is there anything that, it, no matter how small, represents some kind of workers' party, a Labour Party, social democratic party in that sense of the term, uh, 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 in Belize? And secondly, uh, I I wonder about the danger of replacing corrupt politics with ethnic politics. We've seen what a disaster that can be in in places like Guyana. Uh, and uh, I, uh, 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 the fact that I mean, my one brief visit there did seem to be the uh, uh, that that wasn't particularly an issue at the minute. Uh, and uh, would you say something about that as well? Thank you. Yes, um, I, I think we we can approach the, the sort of union union issue um, in the context that um, as has occurred, I think, across the Caribbean to different extents. In the case of Belize, since independence, um, when the two major political parties did have some degree of uh, ideological distinction, um, the People's United Party. Um, having been the party of independence and a bit more progressive, um, uh, the UDP in, in the United Democratic Party, the other major party um, used to be seen more as a, a sort of market oriented. Um, but over time, especially when in power, they've become, um, if you look at their policies, basically centrist, uh, uh, almost parties uh, more to the right and left. Um, both, both identical in, in, in many ways, uh, apart from uh, personalities and, and at some point in time, if you were powerful for too long, who is more or less corrupt. Um, 
that <laughs> that lack of programmatic or policy difference, ideological difference, um, uh, makes it uh, very difficult uh, for the parties to compete on anything else except, or much else than, yeah, who, who can play this plan to this game the best. Um, but I remember um, in, in the book, I also looked at the, is the issue of would ideological difference in, in parties really um, make a difference? Um, we, we saw in, in Manley's Jamaica, for example, that during that period, um, when Manley was in power, clientelism was very high. Uh, and so, so that's a caution. But also, Belize had a referendum on, on whether or not it was going to go to the ICJ uh, uh, in 2019 for resolving the Belize Guatemala issue. And and one, this was the first real national referendum in Belize. It's a key issue. And political clientelism did not play very much of a role in that at all, showing that if, if, if there are issues that um, can, can transcend and are important enough nationally, uh, that can get outside of the, the part of political uh, back and forth, that is useful. But on the um, on the ethnic politics issue, and 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 Steve unions in Belize have been um, among the civil society groups that sporadically have been calling for more more to be done ab about problems like political clientelism in the call for wider political reform. So um, they they do play a role, but um, it has it has not yet had any sort of critical mass. In 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 terms of Belize. Um, yeah, eth ethnic politics um, has not featured um, in terms of uh, political parties differentiating themselves based upon ethnicity. Although we are a multi-ethnic society, uh, it has not happened. It has not happened uh, like uh, Guyana or Trinidad and Tobago, and 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 clientelism actually has been one of those uh, sort of equal opportunity. Uh, phenomena for the political parties who, across ethnic groups, the game is the same. The Maya, the Mestiza, the Garifuna, the, the Creole, uh, the, the game is the same and the strategies are the same. Uh, they get almost equal support from, from both, from all ethnic groups. And, and so uh, while there have been points in time in the history of beliefs where uh, there were some dangers of, of going perhaps in, 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 in a bad direction. So far, ethnic ethnicity um, is just one other of the, in the, the factors. Um, or, or let me put it another way. Um, et clientelist politicians do not discriminate by, by gender, by race, by age or ethnicity. And, and it, it's, basically um, going after every voter in the same way. Great, thanks. So Leone has a question in the chat and she asks, do the evangelical churches, which I understand have a presence in Belize, you certainly write about that, have a role in election campaigning and politics at local and national level? And if that's the case, if so, how significant is this? There certainly has been an increase um, uh, since independence in, in the number of evangelical churches in Belize, um, usually fundamentalist uh, right-wing churches from the U.S. expanding even in the smallest villages. And, and they, do, they do have an impact. Um, their, their impact would, would come perhaps less when it comes to how you vote in a general election, but more on some of the bigger issues that the church might have a problem with. Uh, uh, issues such as, uh, say, uh, gender equality um, policies that would have in it um, equal treatment of uh, persons based upon sexual orientation. Um, they, they would get riled up about things like that and um, or legalizing marijuana, they would organize against that. In fact, the, the churches um, got together in Belize to force a referendum 
uh, by getting uh, by a petition process on whether marijuana should be legalized or not in Belize. Uh, so, so they do have power when they want to wield it. Um, but I, I would say that um, politicians would attempt to uh, get political support through clientelistic means from people of every religion. Um, and uh, that evangelical uh, vo uh, religious people would be, would be among those. Um, I, I, I don't see it necessarily as a, a big factor in, in, in how people might actually vote in, a, in, a, in an election uh, for their particular constituent representative. Great, thanks. Kate, do you want to ask a question? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Dylan. Um, uh, my first question has been touched on already by Victor, but I'll just um, say it in another way, which is that the, the Saldivar story seems to suggest that there are um, some consequences, if not for engaging in these practices, then for being very publicly um, exposed in engaging in these practices, um, in that he had to step down as party leader. Um, but I wondered if, you, yeah, would you say that this sanction only came about because of the external involvement of the US? And it seems that the other side of that story is that um, despite uh, the, the public exposure of the whole nefarious business, that he still had um, enough support within the party who still wanted him to, to stay on as, as party leader. So that was sort of an aside. I was also interested in... Um, the inequalities in the clientelist system that you pointed out. So the poor voter gets their Christmas ham, the middle class voter gets a, a, a university scholarship for their for their child. Um, but it seems like the most nefarious effect is that the political donor gets legislation written in their interests. And whether um, you would like to comment on whether you feel that that's the far more damaging impact on democracy than um, the kind of collective effects of lots of small um, handouts at the other end of the scale that the, in your title, your title says buying votes and political influence. And it seems that the, the people who buy political influence are the, um, the big donors. Um, but maybe is that also something that's easier to address through things like, um, uh, you know, political financing legislation? And maybe on that point to invite you to say a bit more about um, what you hinted at, which is that you have some some ideas for some potential solutions to this to this intractable um, problem. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kate. I think that um, in the, the last question uh, that you asked had had the answers in it for the most part. But um, on 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 the first question around Saldiva, um, and as, as Victor had had hinted at before, um, Saldiva was fired from cabinet by the former prime minister for lying about whether he received funds or not not for anything to do with bribery. Um, this was also the case uh, with two other ministers in that same government. Um, uh, one who had an immigration scandal, a passport scandal for, for some foreigner and was caught red-handed and another who uh, had a land scandal. They were both fired from cabinet, but neither of these three faced any real penalty. Um, that is, uh, there was no court case uh, that um, that did led to uh, any any sanction or any any penalty, uh, any any imprisonment. Um, in fact, they, they weren't even brought, and it, it shows that um, it, there's a lot of impunity in in, uh, in in the case in these cases in Belize. Um, after the the scandal broke in Saldiva, um, and, and, and there was public outrage and talk of drafting political um, or campaign finance legislation. There was actually um, a, a police case that uh, 
was, was, was going to be started, but nothing ever happened to that. And so the next time you hear of it was when Saldiva was named by the US State Department. Um, so as Victor said, it shows the uh, inadequacy, the reluctance of uh, authorities in Belize, perhaps the inadequacy of the legislation to, um, to deal with, with these things at, at the national level. And Saldiva is actually was until well, until this, uh, this State Department um, naming came, was preparing to run again to recapture his seat in his constituency. And when this, this scandal broke, um, the party, his party got together uh, and a small committee um, recommended or uh, decided that he would not be allowed to run for the party. But he is appealing this at the higher level of the party, so he still is pushing. <laughs> and I mean, he is, he's asked for, um, for evidence of, of the why the US made this, this particular case. But the point is, yeah, there, there's been no one arrested uh, in, uh, well, no, no one convicted in Belize of, of this sort of activity. Um, on, on the other question, on uh, the issue of um, inequality, I, I, I think that, um, yes, you're right, the, the key, uh, most expensive damaging part of this is that uh, the, the the very big donors um, are the ones who, in a sense, are patrons to the politicians who are who are their clients. So it's another level of it, and that's why in the cover of my book I have the um, the sort of uh, puppet strings above the hands of hands, uh, and who is controlling the politicians by the donations they give them, partly to fill the demands of their clinics, the political clinics. Uh, are the ones who would, would get most benefit from the, the, the system. Um, and these include, as I said, the, the ability to even write your own legislation um, and pass it to the, to the government. Uh, Michael Ashcroft has done this. Um, it includes um, uh, getting favorable uh, duty-free concessions for, for imports. Uh, it includes things uh, like getting uh, push appointments. Um, and, and while it sometimes is difficult to tie these, these, these things all together and see what exactly leads to the next, um, if, if you sit back and observe for, for a while, you see, you see the connections very well. And so the country ends up losing, um, yeah, lots of income that, uh, that it could gain, uh, the, the leakage of uh, money from the country. Um, and uh, public resources uh, are abused and wasted. And um, in, in the long run, yeah, who then would be the people who uh, are affected most would be the average Belizean. Um, and that goes back then to the issue of, uh, as Steve was saying, um, it's, it's negative impact on social democracy. Very good. We have uh, two remaining uh, questions, I think, uh, in the chat. The first from Jean Stubbs, and she asks, where on a spectrum of political, cl political clientelism, clientelism would you situate Belize today in comparison with the rest of the presumably British Caribbean? Yes, in, 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 the, in the comparative chapter uh, that I did um, in, in the book, and, and remember, the book is, is looking at the period, at least for Belize, from 1954 to 2013. And uh, so I might be able to be able to speak about um, up until 2013, because I haven't done the research um, since then at the regional level. But um, at that time, um, the, the case of Belize, um, I had rated as being next to or similar to Jamaica um, in, in terms of, of the, the incidents in Jamaica. Um, and, but that Barbados was one of the countries that uh, at that time, which, which had clientelism and does, but it was at the lower end. And 
uh, as, as you know, Barbados has had less poverty, more um, sort of uh, social development and, and, and social welfare. And in between would be the small Eastern Caribbean states um, at various places. Antigua and Barbuda and Bahamas tend to be higher up. Um, but uh, Barbados would, would, would be, uh, at that time, would, would be at the lower end. But Belize would be right at the top there and uh, with Jamaica. Great, thank you. So Simon, I don't know if you want to ask your question or you'd like uh, directly, or you'd like it to be read out in the chat or how would you like to proceed? Um, well, I can read it out, I guess. <laughs> right, okay. I might amend it slightly. Okay. I was just interested, um, you know, uh, recently I'm thinking about the case of Barbados, you know, uh, going Republican, um, the visits of the royal family, which sparked up a whole lot of discourse throughout the Caribbean about, you know, um, our, uh, Caribbean status in relation um, to Britain, the Westminster model, etc. Um, and th there seems to be a growing discourse, you know, which, which we could um, frame within decolonization. Um, or even decolonial studies. Um, and, and, and there seems to be a growing realization that um, with direct reference to clientelism, you know, clientelism only um, really prospers because of, well, one of the main facilitators is the lack of any um, opposition, any parliamentary opposition. Um, that the Westminster model is, is not appropriate, that it is subverted, um, and it's subverted, you know, to, to continue this kind of Caribbean boss politics um, model, which is obviously, um, you know, directly really opposed to any social democratic uh, developments. Um, so, you know, if, if, if we view clientelism as systemic, you know, it's symptomatic of systemic, I mean, inherited, you know, I mean, there's a, obviously a historical traje trajectory here, you know, colonial corruption translates into, it's the model, it's the model that people know about power relations and political systems, certainly in the British Caribbean. Um, so, is not a way of tackling that, you know, the legislation has proved entirely ineffective. You know, I mean, judges as well as politicians can be and have been bought. Um, so is it not time really to consider actually, you know, changing maybe constitutional changes? Um, you know, especially, especially, I mean, I live in Grenada. So I'm, you know, uh, I'm very aware of, you know, events, particularly like in Dominica, which had a real scandal over this whole, you know, um, diplomatic passports. An oil minister from Nigeria was, you know, ended up, you know, a trade representative on a, a diplomatic passport. You know, she was in court in Nigeria being sued for, you know, millions of dollars were of, of fraud, etc. So, yeah, and I'm wondering if um, uh, Vernon could, you know, yeah. talk about this, this problem in, you know, in larger terms, you know, I mean, are you just going to put, you know, apply the bandage or mm -hmm. are you going to actually really treat, you know, um, the disease itself? Very, very, very good question, um, Simon. Thanks for that. Um, it gives me an opportunity to... Um, to get back to the question Kate asked about, yeah, what can be done, I suppose, to mitigate uh, this situation. Um, I, I think that, um, and I, I'll come to the, the constitutional uh, sort of um, possibilities soon. I think that's very important, but I do think that that um, in the context of these uh, and other Caribbean countries. Um, we do need to look at um, legislation and regulatory uh, institutions with an eye to strengthening them. Um, clearly, in, in addition to strong campaign finance legislation 
and, and decreasing, um, trying to decrease uh, money in politics, or at least to, to know more about it. I think that um, there's also a need to um, have reforms at the legislative level that improve the, um, the voter bribery laws um, with a mind to decreasing impunity on, on both the side of the, the politician and perhaps the voter. Um, there, there needs to be some more firewalls put up between, um, to put it mildly, the, the, the politicians and, and the people's money. And, and this has a lot to do with oversight mechanisms that again, some of them exist, but what are weak and they fail in, in, in our societies. And, and, and then the, the whole accountability for, uh, for, for the people's money need to be better done. I, I, I do think that um, electoral reform, uh, new, new uh, a whole look at that would, would be useful. Well, one small pet peeve I have there is, is how um, our public service um, has contract and non-established voters categories that are expanding and believes um, the non-established public service proportion used to be about 1% in 1981. It's about 26% now. And these are people who can be fired and hired just for a But getting to the constitution, um, yes, I think you, uh, you're right in saying that there, there's a need to look at our constitutions uh, more, more, more directly. In, 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 the, in the region right now, uh, the Bar Barbados, um, now Belize, and soon Jamaica will have constitutional reform processes. And uh, I think that one of the questions that has to be asked is um, how can the constitution be used to help to address issues like political clientelism and, and by extension, uh, political corruption, that is increasing transparency and, and accountability. And I think, um, and I, I look at Belize, Belize is not in, in, in unique in the region in having a system where the members of cabinet in never make up the majority in parliament. Uh, and this turns the issue of accountability and the concept of separation of powers and that of legislative oversight on its head or on their head. And, and if we can get accountability right and oversight right at this level, how can we expect it to get it right in, in the rest of the system? So uh, there, there, there are um, quite a few suggestions as to how you would deal with this separation of power issue and the lack of oversight issue. And one of course is to basically have fewer or, or no members of parliament in cabinet because our society is too small. Uh, in, in the case of Belize, um, we have 31 representatives and of those, I think my last count was um, when you add up ministers and ministers of state, 23 are in cabinet. Uh, how can that work um, in terms of really having uh, accountability? And we are also not unique in having um, in Belize the centralized discretionary powers of ministers being so vast that they have such control over resource allocation, which is so important to clientelism. And, and there are reforms perhaps that can be explored here. Um, and not the least perhaps is what you mentioned, electoral reform, where <laughs> first past the post um, that has been, yeah, the, the bread and butter of the region uh, is looked at. Um, opposition parties have no role, even if they get 50% of the popular vote. Alternative voices are sort of uh, not even that possible in, in most of our systems. So, so having a, a different electoral system where uh, that provides space and seats for more uh, opposition and alternative voices, that is proportional representation or something to the effect, mixed systems, uh, could go a long way in helping to provide more oversight over the executive and more power sharing. So you're right, uh, setting the tone in the constitution uh, for these things uh, is, is not unimportant and should be explored uh, in, in a very serious way. That's very interesting. Uh, I think we've worked 